Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. Are you ready to get started? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> are you ready? I am. How are you on this fine evening? Uh, I, had a, I had a day. You had a whole day? What happened? That's why I was snarfing down that <laughs> milkshake a second ago. <laughs> and what happened when you snarfed? Yeah, I had a day. What happened when you snarfed the milkshake? Oh, I got a brain freeze. You got a brain freeze. And I'm curious about... I'm, let me be clear. I'm not going to look up what happens when you have a brain freeze, but mm-hmm. listeners, if you are listening to this episode on Wednesday and you know what happens or you look it up and you comment on an in- on our Instagram post, what happens to your brain when you have a brain freeze? Like, what what is it? We'll send you a surprise. Get a prize. We're... We're making surprises. That's what we're... We're making surprises. We're like, we're like skinny female Santa Claus. <laughs> well, then skinny is two a, of us. a subjective or objective. I mean, subjective. compared to Santa Claus. <laughs> when I was in elementary, I was in a musical yeah. that I wanted to be a Santa Claus. You were the real, the Phyllis. That was the point the of Phyllis it. The Phyllis of our time. Yes, I, it was like li- I was a girl who wanted to be a Santa Claus, and you like went to Santa yeah. Claus school, and nobody would let me. Do no, it, but but I did it anyway. Honestly, live your dreams, girl. Um, we also got new microphones. Just so our listeners know, you're gonna notice a a sharp improvement in the audio quality. You might say a clarity. But now I can't snarf any more milkshakes because this shit picks up on everything. Everything. And you're also going to hear probably every time I set my wine glass down, you're probably going to want to stage an intervention. Please don't. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, whatever. You can, but like interventions have to be received, right? Yeah. (laughs) You can intervene, but like ain't nobody receiving that right now. If you come to me at this point in my life, I will choose violence. I don't want to, but I will. <laughs> oh, my God. Listen, I rode my bike to school today to work. Ew. Why? Um, I don't know, because your wedding is coming up and you brought up getting tailored. And I was like, ah, fuck, I got to look good for that. Huh? Yeah. Well, I was like, I need to have my dress tailored. They were like, when's your wedding? I was like, you know, May. They're like, ma'am, <laughs> you don't need to get that tailored ma'am? this week. I was trying to be a an early riser, getting my life yeah. together, early bird. Oh, I and see they were like, No, they're like, ma'am, only the on-time birds here. I see you trying to be on top of things, though, and I respect it because you've got to be. I was, but now I'm like, oh, procrastinate. Got it. There's about to be a whole flock of birds out here trying to get married because of COVID, you know? Yep. Well, I already got married. I'm just saying. Now I'm just having a party about it. I'm I'm here for it. Um, Let me ask you a question. And I prepared this yes. because our neighbor brought us a thing of chocolate, like a box of chocolate with the, the little individual chocolates. How do you mm-hmm. go about eating a box of chocolates when you have one? It's relevant. I find... I find the caramels first. Mm-hmm. And how do you go and about finding the caramels? I know what they look like. Oh, okay. Because I'm a freak. Well, let's <laughs> say in this scenario, it's a mystery and you have no idea which ones are the caramel. How would you go about finding the caramel one? Then I take a bite out of every single one of them. Thank until I you. Find what I want. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I did that because I like the ones that have like raspberry filling, right? I mm-hmm. like the ones that are filled. Of- That's round two. Raspberry? For me. Is number one for me. And then coconut for me. And then caramel is like third on the list. So I bite every one until I find one of those three. And then I eat that one, right? And Eric got so mad at me. He was like, are you biting chocolates and putting them back in the box? And I said, yes, Mm -hmm. but of course, how do I find the ones that I want? Did no one ever love you when you were a child? I'm not committing to a whole chocolate that I don't like. I just want to eat a bite of it. Are you joking? The calories? I won't. Who can afford it? 
Eric. Apparently. So he just picks one out and eats it. And I'm like, was that a raspberry one? And he's like, I don't know. I couldn't tell. <gasps> he's not even enjoying it. He's he's, a, he's just snarfing he's, it. Eric, that is not the way. Our chief chocolatier. <laughs> that is not the way. That's the incorrect way. Okay. Biting it is the way to go. I've been doing it the correct way since I was in middle school, which is the way you're describing. I'm so glad to hear that you do it the same way that I do because Eric made me, he totally gaslit me about it. He made me feel like I was a freak. No, he's a freak. He's a freak. He's like, who That's does that? Gross. Who just eats a whole chocolate they don't know if they like? You don't know. How could you commit? Why would you commit? You don't know. This might be getting at, like, some commitment issues that we have. (laughs) We're like, why would you eat a whole chocolate without knowing if you loved it first? (laughs) Our listeners are all like, um, no, bitch. (laughs) You haven't even moved in yet. That's just you. (laughs) Well. That's not who I thought Eric was. Well, now you know. He's ready to just snarf down a whole piece of chocolate. That's crazy. That's such a, that's so out of the box for me. I didn't even know that was a thing. If you do that, let us know. Yeah. We'll put, we should put a poll. We should put a poll. Who the fuck just eats a whole piece of chocolate before they know? What if it's terrible? You know how sometimes there's ones in there that taste straight up like plastic? I don't want to eat one of those on accident. Yeah, like the coconut ones. Oh, I love coconut. I ain't gonna lie. I know. I said it because you said them and I was like, (laughs) you start with, I'll fucking throw a coconut one away. (laughs) That's how I feel. I'll throw it in the trash. That's how I feel about those ones that are like, you open it up and you think there's going to be a center and then it's just like a slightly softer chocolate. Like, that's just a piece of chocolate. Oh, I like those, but I eat them like glass. Yeah. No, you got to, for me, you got to start with the fruit filled ones. If there's a chocolate orange, fucks with that. I like the orange too. It's like one of, you know, when you had Tootsie Rolls that were orange yeah. and like lemon and lime. That's oh, my shit, but put chocolate an, on it. Here's an unpopular opinion. I fucking hate Tootsie Rolls. I have no time for that. I can't get past it. But if it's like yellow, hit a girl up. Like when you were a kid and you would go to someone's house and they would like give you Halloween candy and they would like open up a bag of Tootsie Rolls. It was like, man, yeah. really? <laughs> 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 Why don't you just pull out the fucking vitamins and give me vitamins instead? <laughs> okay, but let me tell you that we, me and Rebecca, were thrilled because we would have that bag of Halloween candy yeah. and get one piece a night, and you would hope that would last the year <laughs> because otherwise you ain't getting shit. <laughs> <laughs> that is the opposite of what my family did. My family would, we would like empty my Halloween bag out together and we'd be like, well, we got... <laughs> What we no, gonna eat they were like, you better count. And I would sometimes sneak in and move shit to my bag from Rebecca's bag. Of course you did. That's such an older sister thing and to like do. And like switchies. Like <laughs> yeah, switch switchies around. around. What do I like? Your mom is a health freak and my parents are like, go off. Eat all the candy. I know. Banana splits for breakfast, bitch. <laughs> Eat some strawberries, which already have a lot of sugar. Dip those in a bowl of sugar. Dip them in sugar. (laughs) What are you doing if you're not enjoying your life? Jessica's parents wouldn't let her have sweets, and so she came to my house and just, like, binged on sugar. Your mom was like, you poor angel. (laughs) Yeah. Because my parents both have a strong sweet tooth. Yeah, my mom was like, you've never had a banana split? God bless you. (laughs) We have to stop right now. Yeah. And I was like, she's like, did you want whipped cream on it or no for breakfast? Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. They don't even treat it like my my dad just straight up eats like four cookies a day at minimum. He just does. And he's so fucking fit. He really is the fittest man alive. And he straight up eats. I'm going to say I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say he eats six cookies a day every day. That's that is the life I want to live, but I can't because if I eat six cookies a day, I'm gonna look like I eat sixty cookies a day. That's him cutting back. That's him what? like taking a backseat <laughs> break for cookie eating. The six cookies. Jesus yes, my Christ. yes, my friend. That man is a cookie fiend. <laughs> I don't want to talk. Don't look at it. Stop looking at it. I have the. This is gross. I'm gonna tell you anyway. 
Um, for our <laughs> listeners, I have the biggest zit on my chin that I've maybe ever had. It's from the mask, first of all. It's from what the mm-hmm. whole time I'm at work, I have to wear a mask. So I showed Jess saving lives, really. I showed Jess and I was like, look at this big, disgusting zit on my chin. And she was like, tell me about it. I was like, okay, but don't look at it. But look at it. But don't look at it. It's so funny because like I can't see it at all. You tell people that you have a zit and then they're like, like I oh, I like wouldn't it. have seen it if you hadn't pointed it out. And you're like, you're a liar, but thank you because it does make me feel a little bit better. As someone who's grown up with about 70 zits at a time, <laughs> starting with the ripe old age of like 11, they just suck. And I know like I was so self-conscious and I still struggle today, but... Michelle loves an oil, loves a product, so she's really helped me find, like, better skin stuff. Thank goodness. Give me a 10-step system. I'll fucking follow it. If you counted the number of products in my, like, daily routine, it's disgusting. No, you have a (laughs) lot of products. Like When I go on vacation, I have, like, a bag, and then I have a bag for my face and hair products, and I'm a chronic overpacker. Oh, you know I am too. I'm like, but what if we go on a safari? Aren't I going to need my safari outfit? Like, no. What if I pee my pants 17 times in the three days that I'm there and I need to change my underwear 47 times a day? What What if? I don't know. So I'll just take my entire supply of underwear. Literally. No, yeah. We are the same in that regard. Eric's like, what are the odds, though? What are the odds? And I'm like, I don't like to be stuck without clean underwear. What do you want from me? I'm not going to apologize for being myself. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, this is Malpractice Podcast. Oh, shit. <laughs> we always I'm do Sydney. this. And I'm Jess. <laughs> and we're your hosts. And welcome and 20 thank minutes you for in. Being here. Damn. We always do that. We literally always forget. But now you're here. You know us. We know you. So welcome. We know you according gonna... to the data that our... <laughs> Our data has. Wait, what? Our system. What's up, data points? Yeah, we know some shit about you. Yeah, we know some key demographic informations about you. Listen, don't let society pressure y'all. You be, yeah, you be who you, you need to be. Box. Be you. Check, check the box you want to check. In all aspects of your life. It's kind of a good segue, actually, um, to what we're talking about today. Okay. Because I got a crazy episode for you. Yay, let's get into it. I'm a little scared because it's a lot. (laughs) Um, So I'm going to try and be quick talker and make sense. So you got it. Keep up. Um, A couple weeks ago, we were sitting having brunch and then it began. Like how I'm starting with a little story. Love it. The honking where we're sitting outside downtown Austin. So, of course, I'm like, what the hell is that? So I turn around because we're eating outside. Yeah. And we were in the middle of like an anti-Planned Parenthood parade. Oh. And I don't actually know if it was like anti-Planned Parenthood in name, but every single car, it felt like had something about getting rid of Planned Parenthood. Interesting. So it was more of like a caravan than a parade. But they would like roll by with their signs, be like defund Planned Parenthood or I regret my abortion, R.I.P., Oof. It was very weird. That's rough. Right. Okay. Big, big yikes. Don't worry, everyone. I'm not talking about abortions today. Honestly, I was. <laughs> that is going to come, though, at some point. So I'll let y'all go because I'm about to roll in hard on abortions. Yeah. Tell us what's up. <clears throat> but I did want to talk about the history of birth control. Oh, interesting. And people associate often Planned Parenthood with birth control and actually that caravan parade got me thinking about where did birth control come from yeah. and like what well, how did where are we now oh i'm excited i don't know anything about this oh really i'm yeah, about I don't to know teach anything about you this. teach me teach me it's kind of cool so and and by kind of i mean it's also kind of fucked up okay hashtag malpractice well that's the and story we don't of get life. Into that. yeah so not so ironically the earliest forms of birth control along with abortion but I'm not going to talk about that today. Hail from the brilliant minds of the ancient Egyptians and (laughs) And Mesopotamia. Y'all, I'm not drinking. This is real. This is me. We cannot afford the rights to that song. No, for sure we can't. Literally dating back to like 1850 B.C., 
according to papyrus scrolls. So imagine mm-hmm. finding these scrolls, right? Imagine being the, ar- the what is it called? <laughs> archaeologist. Anthropologist, the archaeologist. And they're like, find the scrolls. What do you think that conversation was like? Like, hey, you guys, <clears throat> according to these papyrus scrolls. Okay, but also, like, you know that it was an old English white man who was like, Yes. Ma- I say. Wait, that's Southern. <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally slipped into Foghorn <laughs> Leghorn. Literally. But what you I did. meant to do is like, old boy, you know, like a, you know. I want you to say more in that voice. <laughs> uh, to be fair. <laughs> Scandalous. <laughs> yeah. So on these scrolls, there were things like recipes for like, avoiding pregnancy fyi yeah. honey acacia leaves i don't know if i said that right and lint which formed a cervical cap to halt oh. sperm entry that you would like stick in your vagina gross there are also these um they're called like the gynecological papyrus scrolls that contained all these inform- informative things and they listed like a bunch of stuff and one of them was like if you keep breastfeeding that could help you not get pregnant. We know that's not true. Wait, it isn't? The simple answer is yes. Although breastfeeding offers some protection from ovulation, the monthly occurrence where you release a mature egg from one of your ovaries, it is possible to ovulate and become pregnant. But it may help or something? Yeah, I think that's what they were trying to say in these scrolls because it said, like, hinted that it could work for up to three years. There's also this, um, okay. I'm going to try and say it, self plant that was used as a contraceptive it was grown only in a small area in modern libya and it was so popular that it was overgrown and eventually it became extinct and they used things like animal and fish bladders as condoms oh so the um interesting my god silphium plant was popular in ancient greece and they also used. oh my god i forgot i put this word in and I shouldn't have because I cannot say it. Asafoetida. Ooh. <laughs> Which is another kind of plant. And then Queen Anne's lace uh, was another popular contraceptive plant. And it's still used in some parts of India today. The pull-out method, hmm. also used. A classic. Old faithful, I guess. <laughs> as well as, like, elixirs made of herbs and things like lead or leeches. No. And then people also fumigated their vaginas with nem wood smoke or even inserted oil dipped rock salt into themselves. Ew. In other ancient societies where people live near the sea, I'm sorry. there's this stuff. You said oh. they fumigated their vaginas? <laughs> yeah. I just I'm s- I don't think those were like things that actually worked, but these are like ancient remedies. You know what I'm picturing? You know how they do those mm-hmm face things where you put your face no that's exactly correct i'm Mm -hmm. picturing that just you with that like squatting on your muff and it's like blowing smoke into your vagina that is the vibe um so (laughs) in other ancient societies people live like near the sea and there's this stuff that's like natural sponges yeah they would insert those sponges into themselves and it would like soak up the sperm. Mm-hmm. And they would also sometimes soak these in acidic citrus like juices prior to the act. So it was like painful, like stung. It's like sticking a lemon in your vagina. Yeah. Okay. You may be wondering, was this shit safe? What do you think, Sydney? I'm going to guess that 90% <laughs> of it was horseshit and not safe. Yeah. Not safe. Correct. Ding, ding, ding. Fumigating your vagina sounds terrifying. And very unsafe because I assume there's fire around. It was mostly, it was like less the fire aspect and more like the chemicals that they were putting, you know, in their vaginas directly. Why not both, honestly? So many of these birth control methods were toxic and dangerous and ineffective. (laughs) Pregnancy and childbirth at these times was wildly dangerous anyway, like to be pregnant and to give birth. So obviously people wanted to prevent that from happening most of the time, (laughs) actually. In ancient Greece, women were told to drink copper salt dissolved in water. Copper salt is like extremely toxic. (laughs) And so like they were getting really Sounds sick. Sounds pretty bad, yeah. Um, condoms have been used since at least the Renaissance, but those were used mostly to prevent sexually transmitted infections and not really to prevent pregnancy because, like, the outbreak of syphilis oh. in Europe. People were like, oh, my God, 
I won't stop having sex. What can I do? And like develops a condom. Syphilis goes to your brain and kills you. So literally like they needed this. So let's focus a little on the development of these practices in the U.S. In the early 1800s, the U.S. had one of the highest birth rates. I'm sorry. Why? So I don't really know why, actually. I would venture religious and political leadership at the time. Like at that time, the average woman had given birth to five to eight children. No way. Oh, you know what? Also, because a lot of people like farmed then. Mm hmm. Workers. My mom is one of nine and they had so many kids because they were like, we literally need people to work on our farm. (laughs) That's wild. And while we know that women have been preventing pregnancy on their own for as long as they've been having children, the legislature of many states was working against them. I mean, I guess when I'm thinking about 1800s, I think if everybody is being pretty uptight and with the political and sort of social expectations of the time, as well as like religion was pretty big. I'm going to guess that there was a lot of there was probably a lot going on that kept women having babies. Yeah. Plus, it's like a patriarchal society. And no, totally. Yeah. And even though these laws are made or opinions change, preventing pregnancy is going to happen. Yeah. So like there were methods that came after like the syringe met after intercourse they literally created this like water-based solution and injected it into the uterus with things like salt vinegar liquid chloride zinc sulfide to prevent pregnancy and like the acidity has been linked to working so they would just stick something up there and be like yeah hiya get out of here because i know that naturally your vagina is acidic and it basically kills bacteria and things so it makes sense that if you made it more acidic it would kill sperm yeah murder those bitches (laughs) Um, The the first real technological invention came from American, from the American colonies, actually. It came from vulcanized rubber in 1839. And from that, they made condoms and even the beginning of the diaphragm from vulcanized rubber. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. In the 1840s, many states banned the sale and use of contraceptives, which, cute. Um, But prior to that, antiseptic spermicides and sometimes douching solutions were used to, like, get rid of sperm you didn't want there. And then after the mid-1800s, condoms were popular, right? Cue the, like, volcanic whatever that they were using. Turn up. (laughs) And they were actually legal. And it was legal to, like, have an abortion until you could, the woman could feel the fetus move. Oh, okay. And the rates from 1830 to 1860 of abortion were... What do you think they were? Like, what in what? Like, one out of a hundred? One in five. Really? Women had abortions. Yeah. Interesting. I did not know that. But then, by 1873, the federal government completely prohibited contraceptives, and then 1888, abortions were outlawed as part of this, like, Comstock Act, Uh which is a set of federal laws passed by Congress, and it criminalized a bunch of fun shit but it also criminalized like (laughs) using usps to send anything that could fall under the following obscenity contraceptives anything about abortion sex toys or personal letters with sexual content or any information regarding any of the follow of those things so like before that people were using withdrawal and vagina suppositories and pessiaries which were those small inserts that block sperm from entering the cervix and then after that like they were getting into more almost more dangerous because they yeah. had to do it undercover uh-huh that makes sense so women were using drugs to cause miscarriages while others sought help from like under the table medical professionals who were you know forcing abortions and it was often unsafe and they would like be permanently injured or i mean die yeah like i remember there was an anti-abortion like a law or something that was happening at the capitol in texas a couple years ago and all the um femme identifying legislatures brought coat hangers like metal coat hangers oof yeah that's a scary because women used to like just stab themselves in the vagina with them until Mm. yeah right so scary and unsafe it's so scary So let's fast forward to 1909. This is the first time the silkworm gut device was created and passed around Europe. And through the 1820s, it was like used as 
A condom. <laughs> okay, what is? And in the U.S., what is they it? started. What? what is a silkworm? Silkworm. Oh, it's made out of like the guts of a silkworm. Oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. I'm not here to kink shame anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it was it's weird but like you know you have what you have Do and you, at that yeah. same time the u.s started banning the information surrounding safe sex and contraception which made it obviously difficult for doctors or women's health advocates or good de- decent people anywhere to do anything to distribute information so people could prevent themselves from having to have an abortion by yeah. like practicing safe sex yeah using condoms and things like that right and then bam Here comes Margaret Sanger. In 1914, she coined the term, or rather she popularized the the term of birth control. And that was in 1914. While also publishing her radical journal, which was called The Woman Rebel. At Mm. the same time that she's doing that, we have World War I starting. And that's like women taking on more of outside the home jobs, as well as sex work opportunities popping up around military bases. Oh, that's a good point. So there was some serious need for birth yeah. control. Margaret actually opened the first birth control clinic, even though it was shut down like nine days after she opened it because an undercover policewoman got information from her and you weren't allowed to distribute that information about birth control. Nobody likes a snitch. So she snitched. She was an avid birth control activist, a sex, a sex educator, a writer, a health professional. Hmm. Remember that Comstock law that I was talking about before? Yeah. So Margaret was writing and speaking about her way of thinking, right? Well, she wrote a book called Family Limitation. <laughs> Want to guess what it was about? Uh-huh. <laughs> Not having eight kids. <laughs> yep. And she was prosecuted for that book. And uh, also for maintaining a public nuisance, which she definitely did. (laughs) When she got out of jail, (laughs) she reopened her clinic. She was like, anyway, back to business. To be fair, all the best people go to jail at some point, right? (laughs) Yeah, she's actually not so great, but we're going to get into that in a minute. Okay. I know you want her to be good, right? (sighs) Damn it. You made me like her. I know. I, I liked her until I learned about her bullshit. Damn it. So when she got out of jail... She opened her clinic again, and she even appealed her conviction and ends up winning in People v. Sanger due to the state's infringement on women's rights. So, like, you want to like her. Sounds good so far. I know. She founded the American Birth Control League in 1921, which later became the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Okay. So, sounds cool. You're, like, hesitant now. You're, like, oh. Is she a eugenicist? No, I won't spoil it. Keep going. Yep. (laughs) Then in New York City, she organized the first birth control clinic staffed by all women doctors. In 1929, she started the National (sighs) Committee on Federal Legislation for Birth Control. This served as her focal point for lobbying. From 1952 to 1959, she was president of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. She's cool, right? No. And let me tell you why. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. So the first birth control pill was... In a vid, and it arrived in a little brown bottle, and it was marked as a safe way for married women to treat menstrual disorders. Okay. The Planned Parenthood Federation of America, the philanthropist Catherine Dexter McCormick, and the scientific duo Gregory Pincus and John Rock created these birth control pills, and they were all connected by one, Margaret Sanger. Okay. She was the one who organized the group because she had the connections. She asked the two science guys, um, Gregory and John, to create a cheap birth control pill in this collaboration. She was racist. (laughs) Sorry, not sorry. I knew it was coming. She looked at birth control as a way not only to keep off unwanted pregnancies, but also because she thought it would prevent poverty. And she thought that the way to prevent like problems in society were to keep certain people from reproducing. So providing (laughs) access to specifically women of color would minimalize the negative impact of those people on society. It's so stressful because it sounds like access to those things should be good. Yes. But it's all about the context of like why she's doing it. Right. Right. And the science guys, they feel the same way. Okay. So back to these science bitches. (laughs) Science bitch is going to be my new official title. I'm going to have my lab coat embroidered with science bitch. (laughs) It's Sydney, the science bitch. 
They were working in secret in Massachusetts doing some studies on rabbits and rats. Basically, they figured out a way to prevent pregnancy in those two species. Would it work for women? Like, they had to figure that out, right? Like, does it work? But it's not possible for them to get access to testing that way or that kind of topic in most states at that time. So they couldn't do the research basically in any state. So they chose somewhere that they could have access to fertility trial and not tell the truth. It was tested. They did their testing on women in Puerto Rico. Poor women were given this drug without being told what it was or what the risks were or that they were actually participating in a trial at all. During these trials, three women died during the testing phase, and there was never any autopsies done to determine cause of death. Okay. Right. So remember when we did that episode on sterilization of the Latinx (sighs) community? Yeah, it was horrifying. So this is happening at, like, the same freaking time as those trials. Actually, it's, like, right after those trials. this The trials were happening right after that serialization kind of happened because that opened the doorway for them to gain access to these, like, uh, poor yeah. women. And they also saw that nothing was happening to those other people, so they probably felt really emboldened by the idea of doing it. Exactly. And just wait because... It's crazy. So, like, you're right. Not only it was, like, kind of the perfect place to go because it's not a state. It's a territory. And, like, not a lot is regulated. Plus, the government is literally authorizing sterilization of people there. So they're, of course, not going to be worried about providing them birth control. In fact, they're going to be supporting of that. Yeah. And they are. Want to know a weird connection? The birth control clinics started by the U.S. government in Puerto Rico actually traded hands in funding. One such owner was Clarence Gamble, the heir of Procter & Gamble. Like (laughs) P&G. Like, that's crazy. He believed in eugenics and considered the minimization of poor people as good for community. And, like, he was actively trying to sterilize women Puerto Rican women at that time. So his birth control centers were actually, like, starting places for John and Gregory to, like, access a trial base. John and Gregory are the science bitches? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. It's so disgusting, right, that these... We think about, like, Planned Parenthood and we're like, yes, that's cool. But it's really, like, just for wealthy white women. Yeah. And, like, the opposite for everybody else. Like, it's not really a positive experience for anybody else at that time. Or at time. least it wasn't then. Yeah, for sure. So Puerto Rican women were not given information on these pills at all. And at at the time, like, these pills had higher doses of hormones than even the modern birth control pills today. And, like, the modern birth control pills are not, they're not very good either. Yeah. Like, there's questionable amounts of more hormones, and people still don't actually know all the side effects that birth control can have. Yeah. If you read them, it's like, oh, so anything can happen now? I've started taking this, and, like, any side effect is possible? Right. Like, a free-for-all. Um, and all of the side effects that we see, they were seeing then. But the science bitches didn't actually think that those side effects warranted any adjustment to the pill. Because the first round was 100% effective. Sorry, keep going. (laughs) Right. And then Gamble funded a second round of trials. And that round was tested on people in mental asylums. Of course. Again, without consent. This is a constant theme. I hate it. Keep going. So this is a time where people start to think about reproductive rights, freedom, liberal and conservative values, the government's role in all this and like morality and how that intersects. So the pill was approved in 1957, but only to be distributed for menstrual disorders and women dealt with the side effects due to pure necessity. They were like, whatever, I'll I'll blood have clots, high blood pressure or anal leakage. I'll have like bleeding or blood clots. Exactly. Horrifying shit. Exactly. And they were like, it's fine. It's worth it. And in 1960, Enovid was approved as a contraceptive. And in two years following that, so in 1962, 1.2 million American women are on it. Wow. So... Now onto the BS of access to birth control. So the court case Griswold versus Connecticut overturned the ban on contraceptives for married couples. Cool first step, I guess. Okay. Yeah, it's like, I guess that's fine. But also like, 
why does your marital stat whatever i know why we all know correct in 1968 the fda approved iud's which are intrauterine devices did i say that right yeah (laughs) with two versions and i like the names it's like the lips loop and the copper seven cute names those are cute right in a short period of time over 10 percent of women using contraceptives were using an iud which is good it's like a longer lasting preventative measure can have side effects but they're not they weren't as like unknown as the birth control pill yeah in 1972 the rights to access contraceptive was extended for in a court case i can't say that person's name Einstadt. Eisenstadt versus Eisenstadt? Baird. Eisenstadt. Eisenstadt. Mm-hmm. Sounds right. To unmarried women. But it was in 1972. That's wild. <sighs> yeah. That's wild. That's I don't like know why, a second ago. 1972 is like in our parents' lifetimes, though. Yes. That's crazy. Now, while all this progress is happening for contraceptives, I cannot pause us as we've almost been already talking an hour and get into all of the other bullshit that was happening at the same time. But I want to point out that there was work being done to bring to light the harmful side effects and impacts of the pill specifically. Oh, yeah. So there are three things I want to bring bring up. In 1969, there was a medical journalist, Barbara Demon, wrote a book called The Doctor's Case Against the Pill. In 1970, there were congressional hearings about concerns with the pill, and a lot of people were saying, like, we don't actually know what this does to the women's bodies, and, like, we don't know the real impacts, that we haven't had enough time, has longevity of study, etc. Yeah. And then in 1970 as Reasonable. well— Right. Tony um, Cade Bambara wrote an essay called The Pill, Genocide, or Liberation. This is blowing my mind. Not to mention at this time, there was also like mass sterilization of like Native women by the U.S. government and like the civil rights era and like the gay rights era are all happening while women's liberation is also happening. There's a lot going on. Yeah. So it's crazy. But after all those... All that, like, information, then we see some rollbacks. So in 1974, one of the IUDs was pulled from the shelves. Ooh. And that was after there are, like, seven deaths that were associated with an IUD. Seems fair. And this started some moves from access for other IUDs as well. And I think, like, we don't necessarily have to talk about this today, but it is important to know, like, women's health isn't as studied Right? Oh, absolutely. They'll just call it, what they call it is like health, but like women's health. A lot of the times scientists feel like the female estrous cycle like complicates things. And make it make sense. And it's like, make yeah, it why don't you try what do fucking you having one? It complicates everything. <laughs> right. We're also 51% of the population. And some of us have that complication every time we try to take a nice vacation. <laughs> make it make sense. In 1978, Carey versus Population Services, the Supreme Court says that the states cannot limit the advertisement, sale, and distribution of contraceptives to individuals of any age. Good. So then we see Lark's long-acting reversible contraception begin. Yeah. In 1991 to 1992, bitch, the year we're born, they are surgically, this is when they start surgically implanting small tubes or giving a shot for longer lasting contraception. Yeah, that's crazy. So then female condoms come shortly after that. I mean, we... They were kind of there before in the form of, like, fucking barriers, right? But then we see Plan B in the late 90s and the Nuva Ring and Ortho Evra and... That was late 90s? Yes. And Mirna. They all roll out, like, patches or rod implants, like... All this innovation, right? In the 90s. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's Mentally, so crazy. Mentally, for me, that's also only like 10 years ago. So It's not. I no, know. It, there was this thing that was I like... I don't want to talk about it, but I know. <laughs> I hate it. Keep going. <laughs> In 2013, the FDA ruled that over-the-counter sales of emergency contraception Plan B is approved. Once Plan B was approved by the FDA, 
they like invigorated religious freedom use against individual rights. Okay. So as like Plan B becomes popular and accessing it becomes more normal, we also see like anti-abortion movement kind of spring into action as most of them believe life starts at conception. Okay. So they're like actively against Plan B because it's literally after conception. an abortion in their mind. Okay. Yeah. So today, 62% of women age 50, 15, I was going to say 50, 50, no, 15 to 44. 50. Girl, get off the pill 15. if you were 50. <laughs> you don't need it anymore. Get 15 to 44, use some, <laughs> use some kind of birth control according to the CDC. It's covered by most insurance, even in the Affordable Care Act, although the Trump administration made moves to have religious freedom and allow employers to basically opt out of covering that for people. Because of the Hobby AKA Lobby thing, right? Hobby Lobby. Yeah, yes. okay. But that's where we are. So there. Phew. This was, a, first of all, this is a very cool story. You did a really good job with it, and I didn't know any of that stuff. It's crazy, right? Very cool. Very cool. Shout out to the Puerto Rican women. That's that's like the whole moral of this podcast. If this episode is too long, fast forward to this part and just stop <laughs> treating people like guinea pigs. I don't know. Yes. There was an article Death that says it. like they treated people like lab animals. And I was almost like going to quote it. And then I was like, no, I don't want them to treat. I don't want them to even treat lab animals like this. Like they don't give a yeah. fuck. Yeah, it's horrifying. What really hurt my feelings but didn't surprise me, was Planned Parenthood. That hurt my feelings, too. Because I was all ready to be on her side. You saw me. I was like, what's up, girl? She sounds so cool. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like, on paper, it sounds like she's doing good things. And you're like, but why? And she's like, oh, because I'm a eugenicist. God damn it. You know, it's like I knew it was coming, and I was still like, you buried the lead. Now, I think, like... (laughs) I think she had you good intentions. Start like, with she's a eugenicist and then I don't have to <laughs> like her from the get go. I know, but that's less fun. I, I think know. she did want to provide access to birth control. But I think that the reason she was so invested in developing the pill was because she saw it as a quick solution to the bigger problem, which was overpopulation, which she attributed to poverty, which she connected to people of color. It's shocking to learn about because no one ever tells you this stuff, you know? The truth? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I know. It pisses me off. I did not know that stuff about Planned Parenthood, honestly. Yeah, no, me either. (laughs) And I was mad, right? Because I think we get mad at ourselves. Like, why didn't I know? Like, I thought this was a great organization. And I think it is. Like, I think it can be now. It just wasn't then. You know, it provides services now. But then it was created with the wrong ideals. And that's okay. Like, knowing the whole piece of it is what matters, I think. Just the nuance of the fact that, like, it wasn't created for the right reasons, but it can still do good things for people now. And I think you have to take into, I mean, take whatever you want from this, Sydney, but you have to take into like consideration all the intersections of what was going on at that time and like respect no, totally. the progress. Yeah, absolutely. While acknowledging the bullshit. Because we can call it out. Acknowledge the bullshit. <laughs> Acknowledge it. That's our personal motto. Acknowledge. Hey, Mal Pals, thanks for listening. The sources and links for this episode can be found in our show notes. If you haven't already, go follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Malpractice Podcast. You can also send topic suggestions, questions, or concerns to our email, malpracticepodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out our Patreon for insider extras, behind the scenes looks, bloopers, and more. And just as a reminder, if you like what you're hearing, you should definitely subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. Don't forget, malpractice makes perfect.